Um, when I was young, I grew up between two missions really, Kamaganja Mission and Rumbalara Reserve. And um, being on the missions and being on the reserve, you were really excluded in a lot of ways. And when you went to school, people would, you know, call you black. Um, we'd, we'd fight all the time with other kids. Um, but on the mission too, with myself, they'd call me white. So it was really difficult being in that situation, which is different from some people. Um, when I was 13, I had an interview with the Herald Sun and the interview was about us moving off Rumbalara into housing commission houses and how I felt about Rumbalara. And one of the ways they described me was a 13-year-old um, um, half-caste or part Aboriginal, part Aboriginal was, a 13-year-old part Aboriginal girl. So, you know, that sort of, that's how we grew up. We grew up with the idea that our identity was somehow different we were not white and yet we were not black. And it's really similar today actually when you consider that people talk about real Aborigines. You know, if you come from an urban centre or you come from Victoria, you're not a real Aborigine. And that language has crept in. It crept in as a result of blood quantum, mind you. And that was a government definition that the amount of blood you had determined your Aboriginality. And that's um, really a very nasty, racist, um, way of talking about a people, and that's what happened. Well, you know what? Growing up on the missions, we were accepted, regardless of the fact, you know, that you were called a, actually called a gubba. Regardless of that fact, we were accepted. We loved each other. We got on well together. We were one mob of people, and we had, a, you know, our culture was something that um, was a binding part of our, our lives, really. So we were happy, I was happy, you know, get, being on the river, the Murray River, going down, getting yabbies, doing all the stuff the kids do, that was really happiness. But when you went into the towns, when you went to schools, then you had to be someone different. And um, I was lucky that I had a good memory and I also was determined and I loved to read. I was a reader. So because of those things, I was able to cope in both worlds. And we did have to live in two worlds, actually. I loved my black world. I wasn't that fussed on the white world, but I was able to cope in both. And a lot of kids can't. So I have the best family. So mum's one of 14 children. Um, we've got a big mob. Unfortunately, my grandfather died when my nan was 43, so she had 14 children when he passed away. And um, mum's one of those, so she, mum was a single mother, so I stayed, I was really uh, mostly with my grandmother. We were mostly with my grandmother. So we were a part of a big mob. And we were, one of the things was the love. They loved me and I loved them. They are the best family ever. I'm going to thank the Lord one day for putting me in that family because they're amazing. And you know, warts and all, every family's got stuff, you know, but my family's just wonderful. And the reason they're really wonderful is that love they have for each other and love of community. Um, oh, we were reared up to look after community and that's who we look after. And you know what? When I was a kid, I wasn't allowed to swear. My grandmother, you had got flogging for swearing. Mum wouldn't let me swear, so we were read up not to swear. We were read up to respect our elders, to listen to what they had to say, not to speak out of turn, but to be part of this big mob who loved you. So the family, even though my family was big, we also were part of a great extended family. And Uncle Alf used to say, he said, we're a family of families. And that's exactly what we are. When I was young, the kitchen table was very important. You sit around the kitchen table. My family were political, very political. So you'd be sitting around the kitchen table and my aunts and uncles, my mother, grandmother, they would be talking about politics. They would be talking about all the things that Aboriginal people needed and didn't have. They would be talking about what we should have. And so sitting around the kitchen table as a young girl, listening to that, 
it really impacted on my life. When I got older, um, I did all the things, you know, got married, had children and did whatever, went to university. But one of the things that really impacted on me was um, my, my aunt and my uncle, who were involved very heavily in Aboriginal education. They were on the National Aboriginal Education Committee and they would talk about education all the time and how important it was for young Aboriginal children and how important it was to change the schooling system to accommodate them. So I would listen to that. I would go to meetings. My aunt took me to a Fakatsi meeting when I was 18 years old and I listened to um, people like Kath Walker and Dennis Walker and you know all them mobs, um, Pastor Doug Nichols and all them. I listened to them and I listened to you know the broader issues for the Aboriginal community, not just about your little town or your little area but all over Victoria and all over Australia and th that impacted on me. When I went to university, I actually went to a cultural camp organised by the Aborigines Advancement League. And Bruce McGuinness, Dr Bruce McGuinness, he was in charge of the camp and of course very radical camp activists and so that really lit a fire in me. I had um, Aboriginal speakers come to the university to speak to the non-Aboriginal students. Stuart Murray and Bruce McGuinness, people like that came out to the university. So I started to become very active when I was at university. I marched in the moratorium. I marched in, went up to Canberra and marched. I went up to Sydney and protested about the sesquicentenary celebration. So that fire was lit then. When I got married and had a couple of children, that it kind of like just went down a little bit. And then I came back to teachers college and then I came back. When I look back, I know that in, when I was in year nine, I had a, a local doctor's wife. I, I was hopeless at maths and I'd have a tutor and she tutored me. But what she also did she, was she took me to plays. She took me to other activities outside. And I was living on Rumbelara at the time. And she took me to er, er, things that I wouldn't have been to otherwise. And she was a Christian and she taught me a lot just in... That the, that the world's a big world, really, for a year nine student. Um, my minister, um, Mr Roy Clydesdale, was fantastic. He, he was amazing. He loved the Lord and he really taught me about that. And, you know, I've been a Christian since I was about eight, really. So that's really been a big influence. The Lord's been the biggest influence in my life, I must say. Then my family and then community. And then... <coughs> Other people were like looking at world leaders, um, Martin Luther King Jr. I'll tell you a little story about him. So I had this flag on my wall. I got it at the market in Melbourne and it was his, I have a dream, you know, and his dream come true. Isn't that amazing? But anyway, I have a dream. And um, I had it on my wall for years and I found out later that one of my children thought he was her uncle <laughs> because he was on the wall. He was my favourite person. Of course, the American, you know, when I heard that black is beautiful, which was an anthem from America, I just thought, oh, black is beautiful. We're beautiful, right? So that really had an influence on me. Um, Mahatma Gandhi, you know, amazing the things he did to free India. Um, I looked at world leadership and thought, you know, these people have got amazing, they're amazing. I also looked at like Charles Perkins, that the Freedom Rides, Looked at Kath Walker with the poetry and, you know, all that she did for, for Catsy. Um, I looked at the people in the 96-7 referendum like Faith Bandler and, and um, Patsy Sykes and people like that. So I, as I said, I was an avid reader. Because I was an avid reader, I could read anything that I wanted to read and I was interested in leadership and I was interested in how they, you know, how did they become leaders and what is it about leaders that are, that's so important? And how do you become a leader that is renowned? I actually don't really know how to define my style of leadership. I think that I am sometimes autocratic and sometimes I'm too soft. Um, in the middle there is a really nice leadership style, um, but 
I'm told that people can be scared of me. And um, then I've got, if you cry in front of me, you can have anything you want. So, you know, it's kind of like I'm not really any style in a way. I'm a combination of styles. I do want to, people to think that I care about people. Um, I care about... I care about what I have to lead. So I care about the organisation. I love this old girl, the Aboriginal News Advancement League. I love her. She's protected me and she's protected a lot of people. So I just love her. So I'll stick up for her no matter what. So I can hark up on behalf of her. Um, I love my family, so I can do that on behalf of them as well. Also care about my staff, that I want them to do the right thing too. So really, my leadership probably is all over the place when you think about it. I would say that you need to learn to listen to elders. You, know, you need to learn to listen to leaders. Um, you, you can develop your own style, but you can listen to other leaders and think about a style that suits you. Because of course we've got all different personalities and with different personalities come different styles of leadership. I want to tell young people that you are a leader. Somebody is watching you and somebody is following you. Parents are leaders, their kids watch them and they follow them. So we're all in the position of leadership. We're all leaders. And just because you're not out there on TV or you know in the books or whatever doesn't mean you're not a great leader. You're a great leader if what you do influences people in a positive way. If what you do is influencing them in a negative way, then you're not a great leader. So you need to think about what sort of leader do I want to be and what sort of influence do I have on the next generation or on, on my peers right now. And that is how you'll become a great leader. And I reckon you're all great leaders. <laughs>